Good evening. Uh, my name is Martin, but I'll be your moderator today. Uh, the way today's session is uh, structured, uh, there's an issue that Kenya is worried about, gray listing. What does gray listing mean? What does it mean to be gray listed? Is that good? Is it bad? And Kenya is not the only African country that has been gray listed. Namibia also falls into that category. You heard about science, technology, innovation. We pride ourselves at Strathmore as being one of the key hubs for science, technology, innovation, particularly around information and communication technologies. And then finally, and this will be an interesting survey to set the stage, I'd like everybody to pick whatever form of money you have in your pocket, remove it from your pocket, raise it up in the air, and wave it. Whatever form of money you have. And I'd like the High Commissioner also to look around. <laughs> and Dr. Mungai, just look at what is being waved. Anybody who has fiat currency, we have at least one lady, I request her to stand in white. I think it's a 100 shilling note. Yes, just wave it. Wave it up in the air. Is there anybody else? Okay, there's another one at the back. Okay, we have a few pounds selling. We have shillings. Fantastic. And that's what the debate is about today. What happens when innovation moves much faster than policy? In Kenya today, this is money. And with this money, the interesting things you can do and not do. What happens when you have a majority of society still dependent on what we consider money and are excluded because of technology? That's what I hope we will leave today's session having really thought through. And it's an honor to have you, High Commissioner. I'll request you to join at the front. You get to choose between red and blue, right or left. <laughs> <laughs> and to even if in things out, if you go blue, I'll go red. So we'll cover the entire spectrum. So I want this to be a conversation. Have your pens and paper out, write, take notes, jot your questions down. Have your phones out, take notes, ask questions. I want this to be a conversation. The conversation is structured in three parts. Uh, High Commissioner, I'll ask you to make a set of opening remarks, whatever direction you choose to take those. And then we'll do a deep dive. And the deep dive will be in three parts. I'll first ask about His Majesty, uh, King Charles, who visited Kenya earlier this year, uh, actually late last year, November, and visited some interesting places in Nairobi. A few days before coming to Nairobi, King Charles was very active on issues around how we police artificial intelligence. And it has everything to do with these phones we have. Kenya is one of the test beds for that. Then we've talked about gray listing. So this must be bad for Kenya, and therefore there are people trying to do something about this and get us out of this messy situation. So I'll want us to go into the depths of issues finance. And then I want us to finish off very practically. I want everybody in the room to be on first name basis by the end of today's session with High Commissioner Neil. And High Commissioner Neil is accompanied by uh, several of his colleagues. I'll request Andy, uh, Billy, if you don't mind, and Enos to stand and just wave to the audience. So he did not come alone. He came with his full team. So we have a tech team and a finance team. Uh, Billy uh, is involved in the UK Kenya Tech Hub, so is Enos. And then Andy is the first secretary who worries about all things to do with finance. So I want you to be a phone call away, an email away from the High Commissioner or on first name basis with the High Commissioner. And that will be the closing set of questions. So High Commissioner Neil, uh, without much ado, the floor is yours. Karibu, your opening remarks. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes. 
Um, so I'll keep my opening remarks very short. I'd much rather leave a bit more time for questions and answers at the end. I think that's a, a happiness more as a, as a conversation uh, and not as a speech. Um, but just sort of a, a few words about where I'm uh, coming from. So I started my career uh, in financial regulation, the, the topic of the conversation today. I work for our central bank uh, as, a, as a bank supervisor. Uh, it feels a very, very long time ago now, but that was my uh, original finance background. Um, and looking at finance in quite a, a detailed term, bank by bank, and also looking at country rates. Um, I then worked for a rating agency doing sovereign risk, uh, so that gave me a, a sort of a broad perspective on, uh, on economics and finance, because really where we were looking at countries through the, the prism of their ability to repay debts. Um, but that's quite the sort of <coughs> simplifies a very complicated uh, enti a national entity, but into quite a, a simple question, and that was a good intellectual discipline. And after that, I joined the foreign ministry, where I spent more of my time, uh, where I spent about half, half my career working in Africa, half in the Middle East, um, more with a security focus. So again, that's taking a, a slightly different perspective. Um, but I arrived in Kenya uh, from Israel, where I saw a country which was really completely dominated by technology. So Israel, like Kenya, is more than 50% desert. It has very little in the way of natural resources, and it has what we euphemistically call a difficult neighborhood. So its big asset was human capital uh, and education. Uh, and it's used that to drive a really remarkable economic growth story. So over the last 20 years, so from 2000 until 2020, one, uh, it, and COVID, Israel had positive economic growth every single year through the 2008 financial crisis and so on, and it raised GDP per capita to a higher than in the UK, higher than in most OECD countries, um, and that was driven largely by technology. So Israel has about 17% of GDP in exports just in technology and the yeah. tech sector. Hi, Commissioner, just briefly, I've been requested to change the microphone. I think that's good. So, and the tech sector has really driven that growth. So I've really seen for myself how uh, technology uh, can be a massive source of opportunity in economic growth. And so when I came to Kenya, it's very much through, through seeing Kenya through that perspective, uh, of seeing a, a young population, very high levels of education, some very impressive educational institutions like here, uh, one of the strongest tech sectors uh, in Africa, um, and a kind of energy and, and pace of innovation, which I find really impressive. So that's sort of the, the story of, of, of what, what took me to here, is that move from the, quite the detail of financial regulation, some of the things that you're working on, which is hugely important, but then taking that into a, a broader economic perspective, uh, and then coming back to see the potential in Kenya. So I hope that frames the discussion for the rest of the day. It does. It frames the conversation very well. And to kick us off, um, you talked about spending time working in the financial sector. Money is a store of value. Money is a measure of value or unit of account. And money is a medium of exchange. Money is many other things. You've arrived in Kenya and found money meaning so many things. In this room today, money is not what we think money is. Try and unpack that for us and link it to grey listing. Why, why did Kenya get grey listed? Did we do something wrong? Did we do something right? Are we moving too fast from your world? So let me start off with the, the money question. And so I, um, so before, uh, about 10 years ago, I was ambassador to Somalia. So I was living in Mogadishu, but my wife uh, and children were living here in Nairobi. And so that's when we discovered M-Pesa for the first time. Um, and my wife was sort of, frankly, horrified when she went back to Britain and discovered you couldn't buy anything with a mobile phone. So for her, financially, going back to the UK was a real step backwards uh, in sophistication. And I think that says something about sort of the potential here for, for leapfrogging in the way that we've talked about, but also the speed of adoption. Um, so M-Pesa was originally, in fact, developed with help from the UK. Uh, we provided some research funding for a relatively small development project. Uh, and from that, in a very short pace of time, it was adopted by Kenyan companies, but most importantly, by Kenyan citizens to create this really kind of fascinating e 
ecosystem, which really changed economic growth in Kenya and is now seen as a model for the rest of the world. So on sort of the, the money question, I think Kenya again, has a huge amount to teach the world. And that's why in areas like fintech and so on, we would really encourage British banks, technology firms, and others uh, to come and have a look here. So grey listing, um, so the first thing to say is, sort of, is, is the, the technical definition of grey listing um, is a country that has the political will to make changes to its financial system, but needs to make some technical and practical improvements. So what we're not saying is that we think Kenya is um, a hub of money laundering, a hub of illicit finance, uh, and what we're absolutely not saying is we think that there is no intent in Kenya to, to deal with that. So there's a big difference between being grey listed and blacklisted. Um, I'd also say that a huge number of countries go through the grey listing process. Uh, so parts of the so um, uh, so entities very closely linked to the UK. So some of the overseas territories in the Caribbean, Gibraltar. Um, have been grey listed in their time. Some of our closest allies and some very sophisticated financial sectors, centres like the United Arab Emirates have also been grey listed. So I wouldn't want to sort of anybody to feel that grey listing is some sort of is a is a criticism. Uh, it's not saying that we think that there's a huge problem. But what it is is a very technical process of going through. I think about 105 different uh, criteria. 20 of which are seen as absolutely critical for how the financial system and how financial regulation operates. Um, and it's half of it's a very technical process of just saying, does that meet the technical standard? The other half is then is, do you apply those laws in practice? and can we see evidence of application of those laws? Um, and this is a very long and complicated process. So the UK usually starts grey listing at least two to three years before the review. Kenya had um, started that process a bit later. It made a really good process on changing a lot of the regulations, but didn't have time to complete those changes and didn't have time to implement them. So when it comes to things like countering terrorist finance uh, or proceeds of crime, a lot of the legislation is there, but we haven't yet seen the cases which prove that it's really working. The other thing I would really stress is that the reaction of the government of Kenya was very positive to grey listing. So the, the CS Finance straight away came out and said, we've been grey listed, we're going to work as hard as we can to get off grey listed, uh, and we'll work with international partners, including the UK, the US, uh, and the EU. And we think that's exactly the right approach. To say that Kenya is on an improving track, uh, and we've said so publicly, and I've said so publicly, uh, and the objective now is to get off the grey list uh, as quickly as possible. Um, grey listing does have, have implications, so there are some sort of technical changes to what British financial institutions now need to do when they're working with Kenyan individuals or Kenyan institutions. So it comes with some compliance costs. But I wouldn't overstress the, the, the impact that has. A lot of those financial institutions have to have the know your customer regulation already in place. Um, and as I say, Kenya is very far from being alone in this position. So big as of sub-Saharan African countries, Nigeria, South Africa have been in this position, many others as well. So the evidence that this will have a major macroeconomic impact, a major impact on financial investment is, is much more mixed. But say the key is a country which shows it has the political will and is willing to get off quickly. So that tells us something about what money is, looking at the phones and looking at the notes. I'll move to the realm of technology. Uh, His Majesty the King, when he was in Nairobi, visited the Nairobi garage, and there must have been a reason why the Nairobi garage was picked. Uh, and as he walked around, I think, saw entrepreneurs and saw some of the innovations playing out, something must have stood out and maybe impressed him. What are your thoughts? So first, I have to give credit to Billion Enos, because it was very much their idea that he should do that, uh, and they ran the event, and it was a really successful event, uh, and the king really liked it. I think we and he chose it because we wanted to show that side of Kenya. So during his trip, the themes that we chose were around youth, innovation, uh, and the environment. Uh, and we sort of saw the, the, the Nairobi garage was particularly on the innovation side, but also on the youth and climate side. So meeting 
meeting young Kenyan entrepreneurs who were extremely impressive and also looking a lot of them uh, were offering um, solutions to climate change, were offering um, everything from electric vehicles to carbon capture and storage uh, to green um, uh, power generation uh, and much more. So that was the idea is that we would give the king who's very passionate about using technology to deal with environment changes which is something he's been thinking about far longer than almost anyone. So to see how good Kenyan, Kenyan technology is uh, and he was really impressed. I mean he, he really enjoyed meeting people uh, and hearing these ideas which could have huge application not just in Kenya but much wider in Africa uh, and globally as well. But for me, really, I wanted sort of the, the image to be of him sort of engaging with Kenyan sort of tech and entrepreneurship and innovation in a way that, to me, coming from Israel, felt very familiar. So I said to Bidian Enos that it felt like going to an incubator in Tel Aviv or in Haifa, uh, and there was that same buzz of energy and positivity. Okay, so what, what I want the room to pick up is that if Billy and Enos can excite the king, you can excite the king. So say to yourself, I can excite the king. <laughs> and I want by the end of this session for that to come out clearly. So this is interesting to me, uh, Neil. So you have the Financial Action Task Force, which Gray listed, and then you have Enos and Billy, who got the king excited about climate and solutions and issues around technology. Um, when, you've, when you arrived in Kenya the first time, so there was a stint when you were the high commissioner in Somalia, there was a stint when you were in Israel, and there's a current stint in Nairobi. There's these two extremes. So you've got two individuals who are here at Strathmore, and you've got the Financial Action Task Force, which I want to assume is an office somewhere, you know, with imposing ties and looks. How do you navigate those two extremes? So I want you to reflect on your role as a diplomat. How do you navigate those two extremes? So, I mean, that's, I mean, that's one of the great things about being a, being a diplomat is just the variety of things that you do. And the, so, I mean, and so one of the great things for me about Kenya is just the amazing variety. So, I mean, literally one week, uh, so last week, week before last, uh, at my house, we celebrated Commonwealth Day. And again, we wanted, instead of making this traditional, we wanted to make this more about the future. So we brought, again, in sort of tech startups, innovators, academics, and they had this kind of very modern, forward-looking vision of Kenya and how we can solve these problems. Um, but the week before that, I was up in Masabit, in Moyali, near the frontier with Ethiopia, uh, in a very sort of poor community. But again, seeing how they're using much more basic technology, but irrigation technology, to, to really transform their lives. Uh, and then a couple of days after that, I was in Lamu, uh, looking at the security threat from, from Al-Shabaab. So a lot of my job is about navigating these different areas. Um, but again, I wouldn't sort of uh, the, the grey listing, I wouldn't say it was an extreme. As I say, it, it's grey, it's not black, um, and a lot of other countries are in that position. I think this is something which a lot of countries which are developing a financial sector at speed will go through that stage where they're, they're innovating, they're doing things differently, and sometimes the, the regulation, the systems, haven't caught up with how the market has changed, how technology has changed, and how the threat has changed. And again, I talk about my background being in security, so I spent a lot of time trying to fight against terrorist organizations, mi militia, and so on. Uh, and these are smart and successful people often. So it's about making sure that what Kenya's doing now is fit for the, the current threat uh, and up to, up to the highest international standards. So from that point, I would say draw a clear line between them is we are sort of trying to, uh, or the Financial Action Task Force is trying to help Kenya's financial sector be at that stage where any bank anywhere in the world feels very comfortable doing business in Kenya. Okay, and, and that leads to an interesting set of opportunities. So Dr. Joseph Villa was with us earlier in an earlier conversation. He leads iLab. I think he knows he's familiar with iLab. We've got Dr. Jim McPhee, who's an accountant, I think has sat on many boards, so he understands issues of risk. And Dr. Edward Mongai, who is focused on the areas of innovation and entrepreneurship. As I think of this setting here, we need innovators in this room to come up with creative ways of supporting the Financial Action Task Force 
as entrepreneurs, as innovators in this local context. And I'll unpack that a little bit. The Financial Action Task Force looks at money laundering, it looks at terrorism financing, and proliferation financing, all big terms. You'll help unpack those three for me. And then on the other extreme, when we think of money, earlier I talked about it being a store of value measure or value medium of exchange. Clearly, Kenya fell short on one of those three measures. And it's issues like data protection, consumer protection, anti-money laundering, in the context of a financial system and regulatory frameworks. It's a long question. I've used that as background. Speak in a very simple way to the innovators in this room, the BCom students, the Masters of Development Finance students, the MPPM students, and the tech innovators who are not in the room, the kind you ran into in uh, Tel Aviv in Israel. W what are some of the simple things, innovations, that those in the room should be thinking about to support the financial action task force? Very simple things from the ground. So there's what the minister is doing, there's what all these senior people are doing. But for this room, where do they start? So if I had a brilliant solution, then I would be an entrepreneur and I'd be making my fortune out of it. So that's the first thing to say. Um, but at the sort of more strategic level, I mean, yeah, this, this, there are opportunities here as well. I mean, so first there's an opportunity for somebody who can come up with a, a, a fintech solution or an, or an accounting solution which will help Kenyan entities become compliant with uh, Kenyan regulation which follows the Financial Action Task Force. And again, we've seen how we talk about fintech being a growth sector, but within that sort of compliance uh, and control software uh, has become a huge growth area recently. Uh, and through um, new technologies like machine learning, artificial intelligence uh, are really being applied to this at scale. So there's massive opportunities in finding the solution to that particular problem. But there's also opportunities, as I say, in sort of in Kenya demonstrating that it has a world-class financial sector uh, which sort of can be a, a leading example in Africa and can do business everywhere and can export those solutions everywhere. And again, we've seen fi Kenyan financial institutions be very successful. I used to be ambassador in DRC uh, and Kenyan banks and insurance companies are now doing really well in DRC. So again, there's an opportunity for sort of to say uh, a Kenyan fintech, a Kenyan financial institution, a Kenyan financial solution can be performing to the highest international standards uh, and not just Kenya can be your market, but Africa uh, or globally can be your market as well, once you're at that level of quality. Okay. And you, you mentioned in there AI. So earlier in the introduction, I talked about the king, and uh, the, there was a set of agreements around artificial intelligence. Uh, the UK has taken a strong position on how to reg not necessarily regulate, but have artificial intelligence uh, be fair, be just. Uh, Europe has taken a position, the US, uh, China, etc. Try and unpack for this audience, what, what is the philosophical perspective the UK has taken in exploring artificial intelligence, which at the end of the day also touches on issues of money and finance. What's the UK's thinking? So I think, I mean, it's, it's it, it, more and more obvious, but artificial intelligence is the future. It's going to affect absolutely everything that we do. But this is, but the, the technology is moving much, much faster than the, the regulation behind it. Uh, and we have a very tech-focused uh, prime minister. He comes from a tech background. Um, his uh, father-in-law owns one of the biggest technology companies in India. Um, and so he really sort of gets technology and its ability to change things. And I think he sort of looked at this and saw a lot of the biggest technology is coming out of the US, in some cases it's coming out of China and other places, um, but there needs to be more thought about how artificial intelligence can be um, sort of used as a force for good by everybody. And I think that's the, the idea behind the Bletchley Park Conference, um, is that we should, is that that will provide a sort of a, a discussion forum so we can start to come up with the norms, the principles, and ultimately the regulation, uh, which means that artificial intelligence intelligence can be used as a force for good. I mean, to use a, a concrete example, but one a bit less used at that, that conference, but um, I was working on the applications of artificial intelligence in the military, uh, and we're quite close to the stage where you can have a drone operating completely autonomously with a weapon uh, and can take the decision to, to target something without any human intervention. So there are really big legal, moral, ethical military questions about 
how do you regulate that, uh, and what is the right philosophical approach, the right legal approach, to make sure that there is a, a human in the loop uh, before that decision is made. But how exactly uh, is that done? So there are sort of giant questions to grapple with, and we felt that the UK is not being host to any of the rival com um, technology systems, could be a sort of a neutral broker, uh, which is why we had both the US and China, and as you appreciate in the current sort of global environment, that's quite a difficult trick to pull off, but we, we managed it. Um, there's a lot more to do, but we think it's really important that we have those discussions now. Okay. And Kenya was one of the signatories to the Bletchley Agreement. And interestingly, within 2023, there were many competing countries trying to come up with multiple frameworks. You, you talked about a philosophical orientation. The one colleague in the Masters of Public Policy program, I know there was an exam today uh, for those in the modular program on philosophy. So I'll mention some good luck. Good luck huh? I'll I'll mention some philosophers, huh? and this goes all the way from 1588 to 1950. Some will be economists. J just see if any is familiar, and then I'll ask you to reflect on any two. If that's okay. So I, I'm not the philosopher. My son is a philosopher in the family. I'm, right. I've, I've done three degrees, but none of them is philosophy. Philosophy. So you're going to catch me out. No, <laughs> I, I think you'll pull this off. There are some economists in there also. So you've got Thomas Hobbes, who talks about the state of nature, the social contract. You've got John Locke, who talks about liberal, liberalism, the social contract. You've got John Stuart Mill, who talks about liberty. You've got Karl Marx, who talks about capitalism. Adam Smith, free market, classical economics. John Maynard Keynes, who talks about macroeconomics. Uh, David Ricardo, classical economics, law of diminishing returns. Uh, Joseph Schumpeter, who talks about creative uh, destruction, evolutionary economics. Uh, the last one is not really an philosopher, nor an economist, he's the late Professor Calestas Juma, but he went to school in the UK, and he was big on science, technology, innovation for sustainable development. Any of those names stand out for you as you engage this audience, and why? Uh, so I'm going to start with Hobbes, who sort of famously had this idea of uh, the, of, uh, of competition, of nature read in tooth and claw, um, partly because some of my background is in international relations, and he is seen as being um, almost the father of the realist school in international relations. Um, I think he feels relevant today because we live in an environment where there was a feeling in sort of the 90s, the 2000s, that we were in the, the end of history, uh, that we were in the, what we call the rules-based international system, where there was a fairly clearly understood set of rules which most nations would, uh, would abide by, and there was a kind of trend, trend, general trend towards democracy and justice. And I think we've seen that become much more uncertain. I mean, the, for, for us in the UK, the Russians' invasion of Russia's invasion of Ukraine is exhibit A in this, but more in this region you're seeing sort of high degrees of instability, uh, competition within states and competition between states. So I think we are in a world where sort of we, we thought that Hobbes' realist world didn't exist, but the world is feeling a bit more like that now uh, and how we recognize that. Uh, and second, on the, the theme of today, so he posited as a, a counter to this Leviathan, the idea of this, the Leviathan, the creature from the Bible, but that would um, sort of exert a li an, an, uh, would exert control, which would bring stability, but would take away a degree of liberty. So I think as we're talking about um, regulating technology, this is the dilemma that we really have, is how much of our uh, individual freedom, how much of our autonomy, how much of the, the freedom of companies um, are we willing to give up, given the forces for good that they clearly are, but balanced against the risks that we just talked about, about sort of uh, regulating, whether it's artificial, um, uh, whether it's artificial intelligence, whether it's use of large data sets, uh, whether it's the data that we give away to apps like TikTok. So what is the right balance? And I think that philosophy, philosophical challenge uh, is really with us uh, at the moment. 
Uh, and then I think sort of Schum we're also in a world of Schumpeter, so destructive uh, sort of ha the the theory that in order to have positive change, you've got to accept a level of destruction, and that's a very live debate as we see the damage which can be done by that sort of um, creative destruction. But we're also seeing a highly competitive world in which a world of very heavy regulation, being very risk averse, not willing to change things, that also carries very heavy costs as well. So there's sort of on the one hand a, a fear of change and aversion to change, um, which speaks to sort of the fear of creative destruction, but I think we're also seeing the consequences of not allowing it. Have I passed my... Absolutely. I don't think I'd have passed the exam, but maybe as O level at least. No, no, no. You've, you've reflected on it. And I wanted to... I wanted particularly to excite the Dr. McPhee's, the Dr. Mungai's, that academic dimension. I'll request at least one or two questions from you. Uh, Hobbes argues life is short, nasty, and brutish. Things are messy out there. So you need government Leviathan to put some order. And then Schumpeter talks about creative destruction. So you have to destroy the current in order to get to what's in the future. I'll, I'll, when we come to q and I'll ask you to reflect a little bit from a perspective of Strathmore in a Hobbesian world and in a Schumpeterian world in a question for the High Commissioner. So my last question, when you see this audience and when you see the master students here, uh, you're six months into your role, but you, you're many years into the role of being a high commissioner, uh, serving His Majesty's government. What stands out for you? So if I'm honest, so, I, I, so like many of you, I did a, a part-time master's uh, in uh, economics while I, while I was working. And I have to say, I have huge admiration for people doing that. It was one of the hardest things I've ever done to do a, a really busy job with a lot of travel uh, and then to combine that with a, a master's degree at the same time. So I'd say sort of a huge congratulations uh, and good luck to all of you. I know it's really difficult. I really struggled. Um, but it really helped me in the long run, that professional development development, that academic development that I got, uh, helped me hugely. So I know it, as you asked to do sort of three hours of maths or regulation at the end of a long day, it feels like a lot of work, but I hope it will be worth it in the long term. But you have my, uh, my best wishes for that. Okay. So we are just before the 30 minute mark. I want to open the floor for an initial round of questions. So Mandela, you'll move around with the microphone. Anyone with a question until this point, just raise your hand. The microphone will come to you. We have two at the front. Dr. McPhee, allow your question to be the second. Let's start with the gentleman behind you, and then you go second. No, that's all right. All right. Um, yeah, my question is a little bit different, actually. Um, you know, in Africa, we're trying to get the Africa Free Trade Association, and uh, I was with uh, people from that organization. They're trying, the, the African Union is actually trying to uh, make sure that there's value added in two areas, cocoa and also coffee. Um, I've actually advised them that, um, you know, I think it would be much better to have cocoa because uh, when you look at the production of Ivory Coast in Nigeria, you know, well, Ivory Coast dwarfs every other country in the world, okay, and then you've got Nigeria close second. Uh, coffee, uh, you know, we actually sell coffee in supermarkets in the U.S., okay. Blue Mountain coffee has been known there for many years. But um, you in Britain went away from that, um, and I actually have a problem because, you know, I've got a past student who, he's in the, he, the egg business. All of his raw materials come from Uganda except for lime from Koru. So if we have Africa tree, free trade, our economy may be decimated. Now, Britain decided, let's get out of the EU. Could you give us some advice whether we should <laughs> do something similar? Or, you know, I know it's, it's created problems for, 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 for uh, Britain. You know, would we have to have the same sort of problems if we were to do something similar in the Africa Free Trade Organization? 
Okay, so that's a question on Brexit. <laughs> uh, so, I mean, I'm, 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 I'm absolutely a believer in free trade uh, without any, I mean, with some qualification, but, but really very little. I mean, I would say, and we, even after we left the EU, we still have a free trade agreement with the EU, uh, and we've really been u- trying to use Brexit to sign more free trade agreements rather than fewer. Uh, and since 2021, we've had a free trade agreement with Kenya, uh, and we're now looking to see whether we can expand it and push it further. And my last job, I was working for us to have a, a free trade agreement with uh, Israel as well. And we see potential to actually liberalize in a lot of ways because it can be easier to do these deals as one country than as 27. Um, so I mean, the example I use is in the free trade agreement that we had between um, the EU and Israel was about olive, had a big bit of it about olive oil exports to Israel. I mean, Britain doesn't grow much olive oil, uh, so that wasn't relevant. But the word internet wasn't mentioned because it was based on the 1995 agreement. So something about making agreements that are modern. On the, on the Africa free trade, uh, I mean, I think the Africa free trade, continental free trade agreement is a, is a great aspiration, but I think we would say focus much more on things that you can do near at home quickly. So again, I was up at Mayali recently on the border with Ethiopia. You can see a really good road. So you can see the potential for there being much more trade as at Lamu port at Lapset. And again, you see the potential for that to be turned into a regional hub. Uh, and even up in El Wak on the border with Somalia, where there's a sort of a closed border. And I would say that sort of country like Kenya is really well positioned to do much more in the way of trade with its immediate neighbors uh, and has much more to gain than to lose. I mean, you talked about philosophers, but Adam Smith sort of started off this with the theory of comparative advantage. Um, and again, the Schumpeterian destruction, it will be difficult for some people in some sectors, but we, honestly, when you go up to the border with Somalia, you can just see the obvious benefits from being able to trade freely with a neighbor are so striking that I would say Kenya could do a lot more through the East African community uh, and a lot more through bilateral deals. And I'd say that's where we, the UK, are trying to help out with building border posts, providing technical assistance, adv- providing advice on sort of non-tariff barriers and customs regimes just to reduce the friction because all the statistics show that African countries trade sort of too much with countries in Europe and too little with their neighbours. And we think that removing that friction is a huge opportunity. Okay, thank you. Go ahead. And if you don't mind, introduce yourself, name, uh, and maybe program. I'll just press the... Okay. <coughs> thank you so much, um, Ambassador, Your Majesty. I'm Abdul Basid, MDF student here. I'm an international student from Somaliland, formerly Somaliland British Protectorate. So, UK invested, uh, my question is UK invested, prepare a port and prepare economic soon. Also, UK funded Hargeisa Bypass, which is part of prepare a corridor, economic corridor connecting from Somaliland to Ethiopia. So, but in other hand, Somalia, we don't have uh, international banks, although we have uh, a really amazing story of mobile money, which is called Z. So, isn't the time you, you invested the infrastructure of Somalia and the trade? So, what do you what do you think UK should invest in now Somalia? that sector of banking and finance to create more about the regional integration and economic integration. Thank you. Yes, so I, w- I went to Barbara quite frequently when I was ambassador in, in uh, Somalia, and I travelled a lot to, to Berber and to Hargeisa. Yeah, and we we invested heavily in that that port, and it's sort of everybody says it's really transformed. But for the reasons I was just talking about in my last answer, so we see huge potential to yeah to use Berber port to access deep into Ethiopia. Huge benefit to Ethiopia. Huge benefit to Somaliland to really drive the economy. So we think more of those sort of regional connections could really play a part. And again, in a sort of, sort of in a in an unstable region, the more you can create these economic links and the economic stability that comes out of that, we hope that will reap a whole load of sort of broader positive benefits as well. So where yeah, we will continue to look for those opportunities and continue to to invest there. 
I should say Berber is a beautiful port as well. I mean, it's as a, as a city, the coastline there is absolutely spectacular. Okay, thank you. We have a question here in the middle. Yeah, um, my name is John Mangi from MDF uh, 2022 cohort. I have a more overarching question. It's not specific to any country. Um, and it's to do with the sort of bi-directional relationship between financial intermediation and the movement of international development assistance. And specifically thinking about the role of the likes of IMF um, and how they can facilitate um, more participation of the local financial systems to enhance um, and be able to access uh, you know, different pots of money from international development assistance. So my question is, with regards to your experience and even looking back to your days around uh, working for the regulator, what would be your advice for African financial systems really looking to unlock the potential for financial intermediation and specifically looking at uh, directing development uh, assistance, you know, for example, from guys like DFID um, coming into developing countries? So I might ask Andy, who's uh, the expert at the High Commission, to come and talk a bit about that. Uh, I mean, the first thing I would say is sort of don't underestimate how good African companies are already. So the example we just used of Dahabshil, which is one of the Somali uh, money remittance companies, I mean, is a hugely successful company. Uh, and that has, again, linked to international aid. So uh, much more aid to Somalia in the form of remittances from Somalis and Somali landers overseas through, comes through to Habshil and straight into people's pockets then is given by international aid agencies by a huge factor. So I think it's first to just look at how, sort of how good and successful that technology was and how it was adopted with sort of really no international assistance or support or, or regulation whatsoever. So really to, kind of to, to praise that as a strength. But I think we do want to see how yeah, organizations like the IMF and the World Bank can unlock much more finance for developing countries. And that's something where President Ruto uh, has taken a real lead, both on reforming those institutions, but also using in innovative financing models. So um, green bonds, debt for nature swaps, performance swaps, and all these other good financial instruments. And again, we sort of, we think that the more we can use successful African examples, and Kenya, we think, could be a pioneer in that because it's got a good advanced financial system, then we can roll that model out sort of much more broadly. But Andy, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, just to add to what you said there, Neil, as well as the financial firepower that organizations like the IMF and the World Bank bring, their research, their reporting is also really critical for the confidence that international investors uh, and international finan financiers have in both in both a uh, sovereign state's financial system, but also in individual organizations. So I think where you want to try and get more funding from organizations like the IFC or BII into Kenyan markets, it's really about getting the basics right, making sure that your uh, compliance is all in order so that organizations like that have the confidence to invest. And then when you're looking to expand the reach of that, it's really about embracing technology, like we've been speaking about earlier. And I should say, so we, we support uh, two organizations called Financial Services Deepening Africa and Financial Services Deepening Kenya. And Andy sits as uh, chair of uh, one of those, both of those, Kenya. Uh, so, I mean, precisely with this objective of trying to sort of help local financial markets and institutions develop so there could be that better access to, to sort of both local and global finance. Okay, there's a question at the back. Uh, as that question, just before the gentleman asks that question, I'd like someone to ask a question building on these two characters. James Bond, Mr. Bean. <laughs> Over to your question. Okay, so this will not be about James Bond or Mr. Bean, but... <laughs> Alright, so I have, I think, a three-part question. Um, one is that we see that the countries that have been grey listed, there are 21 of them, and 60% of them are in Sub-Saharan Africa. Does it mean that there's some structural issue in Sub-Saharan Africa that is making these countries be relisted? 
that is not existing anywhere else. Um, two, we see that uh, regulation always follows innovation, right? And we have a case where the biggest economies in Africa, that is Nigeria, Kenya, South Africa, are all grey listed. On the surface, it may look like these economies are being punished for uh, encouraging innovation. How can, is there a way that you can work with the, the tech and other financial services uh, players in this region to encourage innovation without the punishment? And as far as this is concerned, you see already what's happening in Nigeria now, where the, the Binance cryptocurrency exchange executives have been held there for three weeks now. And the Nigeria government is asking for $10 billion in penalties, which doesn't make sense. But the, the network effect of that is that any tech person down there will be reluctant to put their head up. Um, three, beyond the immediate concerns uh, in supporting the government to get out of uh, relisting, are there any long-term strategies that the UK government is looking at, uh, at helping the Kenya government to work on, just to make sure we don't get back here after some time? Thank you. I'm Gilbert Oko with the MBA class. Thank you. So uh, I may not remember all the points of question, but on the, so on the first question, I think you have, as I said, it's important to stress that 40% of the countries on the grey list are not African countries. So sometimes there's a perception that this is targeted against Africa, which we would really disagree with. I think what you do have in Africa is you have a combination of financial institutions, which have developed quite quickly and are linked into global networks. The regulation hasn't always kept up with that. Uh, and the threat, as I talked about earlier, certainly has evolved very highly. So there are real issues around uh, money laundering, proceeds of organized crime, in proceeds of corruption, terrorist financing, which sort of need to be tackled. So say, again, the grey listing recognises that countries are, have the political will to make improvements. Uh, it's sort of, it, and then there's a process of trying to give them support uh, in their efforts to, to achieve that. Um, I think the second question, so remind me what your second question was. Regulations for innovation. So regulation for innovation, I mean, so again, this is we talked a bit about in the philosophical question. And there is this tension between you want to allow innovation as much as possible, um, but you need to sort of get the balance between the opportunities and the potential harms. And that's an incredibly difficult balance for anybody to get right. Um, I think we in the UK sort of come and go sort of at periods we try to be as sort of minimal regulation as possible, maximize innovation. But anywhere then if you get you see a threat, you have a scandal, then you have a tendency for regulation to go back in again. So you're always sort of getting that balance right and as a former regulator, it's very difficult to to know exactly where that is. But I do go back to the point about sort of yeah innovation is is sort of will be vital for the future of all global economies and very much including African economies given the level of jobs that you need to create uh, over the next 20 to 30 years. So I think countries like Nigeria are really good at innovation. You see I've been to Lagos, you've got a very dynamic and impressive tech sector there. So I think the trick for the government there is how do you yeah, sort of get a degree of control, sort of punish as appropriate bad speculators, but without stifling regulation in a way, innovation uh, in a way that does long-term harm. And I don't think there's a, an easy answer to that that question at all. So, and the okay. third question. The, the third one was any long-term UK strategies to help Kenya uh, to get out of grey listing beyond the immediate effort. So I mean, I think it's, it's, it's some. So it's, it's. I mean, it's not an immediate process. It usually takes countries a, a year and a half at least very often more than that to get off the grey list so that it's not sort of uh a very fast thing to do, um, but we want Kenya to get off uh, as quickly as possible. But again, that comes back to some issues we talked about before about financial sector deepening. So how can you deepen financial sector institutions? Uh, and then we have, and I've had for a long time, deep cooperation with Kenya around uh, judicial reform, uh, around anti-corruption efforts. Now it's just at the um, Ethics and Anti-Corruption Commission today, um, around um, helping the law enforcement authorities, helping with to terrorism. So all these areas will make sure that there are the right controls, the right prosecutions, uh, and the right processes in place. But say that will always be very much driven by the Kenyan institutions and the Kenyan government themselves. 
Okay. Maureen Misu is my name and my question is uh, to your excellency. Uh, how do you see the balance uh, between harmonizing the economic integration among different countries while appreciating the fact that we come from different economic landscape? Is there a way we can be able to integrate and have the same uh, financial regulation all around? Thank you. So it's a, a really good and complicated question. Um, I mean, part of it is I think there are some global standards in some areas, as you say, like around financial regulation. We think that having the sort of a high standard or having the high and the right standards um, offers the best protection. I think partly that's because the threat doesn't really care about borders, so you need to have a, a, as good a level of protections in one country a, a, and as another. Uh, and having common standards has sort of clear benefits in terms of giving people the, the right level of assurance that then they can do, do business or engage uh, and manage their risks um, appropriately. Um, on the economic integration, so our um, our free trade agreements with countries like Kenya do make sure that we recognize that there are those differences and we provide uh, sort of a greater level of access to Kenyan markets uh, to make sure that this isn't being done to the disadvantage of Kenya uh, or other developing countries. And then coming back to the earlier question, we think that's why sort of starting off with regional integration offers a lot of opportunities as there you're more likely to have countries which have got sort of um, sort of the comparative, the theory of comparative advantage is likely to work better as you're more like to have kind of clear complementarities uh, and an evil level of playing field between countries in the same region. So we think that's again why things like the East African community are a, are a good way forward. Does that answer the question? But it's again, it's one of those ones where there's sort of not a perfect answer and you're always sort of worrying you've got it a little bit wrong. Okay, I'll go back to James Bond and Mr. Bin. Uh, James Bond and Mr. Bin are two of the UK's best exports to countries globally. <laughs> and I pick that uh, specifically because it represents the creative arts. I noticed we spoke quite a bit about financial regulation. There must be artists in the room. There must be musicians in the room. There may be actors in the room. We've got a proliferation of YouTube videos and TikTok, etc. Under uh, the agreements that the UK is doing, the free trade agreements uh, with Kenya, for example, in the East African region, what opportunities are there for somebody in this room to create a Mr. Bean, a uh, James Bond, and could be a character that's local and for which there's an export market in the UK. Uh, allow me to pick other examples. Agriculture, we've got a lot of farmers in the room, I want to assume. Somebody may be growing lentils or green beans, or maybe I see some people already starting conversations. Carrots, uh, fruits. Uh, somebody in this room may be interested in those, and these questions are not too simple. The High Commissioner is here. Where do they start? Uh, it could be questions around uh, attire. So is it Saville Row, where you get fantastic suits? We've got uh, tailors, we've got different actors here in the context of the African continental free trade area. What are some of the things that cross your mind when I talk about Mr. Bain, James Bond, carrots, lentils, and suits from Saville Row? So, yes, I mean, the creative industries in Kenya have huge potential. Again, one of the things that we, we took the king to was to uh, Nairobi Street Kitchen this time. And there we introduced him to Kenyan creatives, very much including fashion designers. So he did get to look at some Kenyan suits, um, but people making, um, uh, doing music demonstrations, people doing, um, I mean, it feels so long ago now, I'm trying to remember what some of the other really good ones are, cartoons, uh, puppets, um, a whole range of, creative arts and he was really uh, impressed by that and that clearly is I mean in the UK the creative industries uh, account for millions and millions of jobs and billions of pounds of exports so it's absolutely a sort of an industry of the future and Kenya has real potential absolutely regionally but more broadly as well and we've seen how countries like uh, Nigeria or South Korea 
have really become creative industry powerhouses. So we see potential. One of the things that we try to do is to help turn sort of creative ideas into commercial opportunities. So through the British Council, we specifically run a program for to help um, to help creatives become entrepreneurs to give, teach them how to build a business plan, how to market themselves, how to market their product. So yes, we absolutely see that potential. Um, and in agriculture, again, I think there's a risk that agriculture is seen as sort of um, a, a less advanced form of business. But again, coming from Israel, that's absolutely not true. Where I saw what you can do with sensors, what you can do with um, chemicals, what you can do with technology, what you can do with uh, artificial intelligence, satellites. So we absolutely see potential in Kenya with sort of the potential that is there, but to really dramatically raise productivity by using some of these advanced techniques. And I was in uh, Homer Bay a few weeks ago, uh, and there there's a company called Victory Farms, which does fish farming, but they, they're clear that one of their advantages is use of technology to try to really improve their productivity. So again, I would, I would say there's sometimes it's seen as a choice between technology and agriculture, and I absolutely think that that's a false choice there. The future of agriculture is technology. Okay. And allow me to direct that question, a question to Dr. Mungai. You're passionate about STEM, science, uh, science technology, entrepreneurship, mathematics? Engineering. Engineering and mathematics. And there's the audience here with BCom students, MDF students, and uh, uh, MPPM students. And everything you're hearing from the High Commissioner, where does Strathmore sit? And how does Strathmore fit into this larger ecosystem? What's keeping you awake at night? Your answers may be in the audience and not on the stage. <laughs> uh, surely you want to know what keeps me awake? <laughs> Thank you very much for the question and uh, I'm enjoying the conversation. Uh, so yes, um, the university historically has grown quite aligned with the needs of the country and the region. And now we are positioned at the African level. So I think uh, what the university has done is to identify technology as a big driver for what is happening now and in the, maybe in the foreseeable future, all the things you have been discussing about AI, all this. So when you look at uh, other industries, technology is not different. I think from a university standpoint, we see that this is an area where we can contribute uh, by developing leaders to develop those industries. And when you look, for example, at the conversation about AI, I think you already see the issues about whether it's for good, can it be used for harm. So you need uh, the first thing has happened in other areas, whether it is raw, whether it's accounting, whether it is whatever business. You need people who are technically qualified in technology sense. And that's where STEM comes in, because this is the basis of uh, technology. But on the other hand, as we have done in all the other programs, we have to support that with the A. In fact, people call us team, because you need the art side of things. So you have to embed ethics, you have to embed uh, other things about philosophy, so that at least people have a, a broader picture. So I think that's what Strathmore is doing, and what's keeping me awake is getting that project done. I was mentioning to the His Majesty about it, and anybody in the room, this is something we feel is required. Uh, we are convinced about it, and we are obviously looking for partners that can help. Now, talking about uh, James Bond, if you want me to chime on that. Uh, okay, you know, James Bond, and connecting that to Schumpeter, is one of the classic examples about this creative destruction. Because every time you have a James Bond, you know, the, the, the new one comes, the old one goes, but the movie continues. So it's, uh, if you ask me from an entrepreneurship perspective, just shows why sometimes you have to destroy what exists so that you can continue. So I think it's a good example of what we can also do uh, locally in terms of seeing some of the uh, institutions, large organizations that are reading, but we know that if they are not destroyed in a positive way, then they are going to go down the hill. And my question, because now I have the mic, is uh, here in the business school, and I think it's something that's also established in research, uh, one of the drivers of technological growth uh, development is actually a large organization. It's true you have to support entrepreneurs, but you need this James Board kind of corporate that has to keep looking out for the next James Board, growing them up so that by the time you get the next movie is up to stage. So I would like to hear a bit more how 
if there is a way in which we can support the existing, especially medium-sized companies, where you already have very people, people who are doing good business, but they need support to scale. And those can really be the new innovators that drive. So just if there's some thoughts on that, we're more than happy to hear. Thank you. Okay, great. How do we keep creatively distracting like James Bond? Uh, so I know that. I know the head of our intelligence services, so he flinches when everybody talks about James Bond. Um, but I know, but I mean, I mean, I come from an institution which is now three or four hundred years old, so we've had that sort of challenge of continually having to, to change who we are, what we do, how we do it, and how we use uh, sort of technology, while also keeping some of the traditions going. So it used to be that, I mean, there was no faster form of communication than a boat, so if you wanted to send a message to an, a foreign country, you would, it would take you three months to go there and back. Now you can do it instantly, but the rules that we still use about the, the status of an ambassador, how you engage with other countries, those haven't really changed very much in 300 years. So we have this sort of challenge continually. Um, I think there's something about the importance of uh, saying yes to people. There's a tendency of big institutions tend to say no, they tend to be risk averse, they don't want to do things differently, they focus on what's always worked in the past. So it's how do you have a culture where people are constantly saying, yes, let's try that, let's give it a go, let's do something different, uh, and encouraging that, that bottom-up culture. Because again, in most organizations, the, the best ideas come from people lower down in the organization who are younger, more dynamic, less sort of constrained. So how do you create a culture where those people feel comfortable speaking up, challenging, having ideas, and think that they will be encouraged rather than uh, told, no, this isn't your, your place to come up with these ideas. And again, I think that's why educations like you giving people here to younger people is so important because that helps give them the, the authority, the confidence, the expertise to be able to sort of turn an idea into a proposition uh, which people will then listen to and take up. Excellent. Uh, yep, I think Billy wants to add a point. Uh, do we have a microphone? Yes. And we are just about at the one hour mark. Yeah, thank you. Uh, just to add on to uh, what uh, Dr. Ayo has shared, um, the UK continues to be a very strategic partner in Kenya, and especially when it comes to scaling entrepreneurs and uh, SMEs here in the country. Uh, we have very unique programs that we are running, and one of them that just come to mind as you're talking uh, is one called the Global Entrepreneurship Program. I know the conversation will continue as we, as we go on, but it's a very unique program that tends to look at uh, high-value SMEs and startups uh, in several countries, then giving them an opportunity to scale in the UK. So by virtue of uh, establishing their offices in the UK, helping them to settle there and unlock in those markets, they end up getting markets into Europe and ultimately also into into the into the broader Asian Asia Pacific region and the North American region. So I mean and there are so many other programs that exist like that. Specifically on startups, we have the Unicorn Kingdom program and uh, Many more programs I believe we're also discovering right now with Enos, but very strategic in terms of helping entrepreneurs scale and get to the level that we want them to get to, to access international markets. Okay, thank you, Billy. I promise we'll be done at the one hour mark. So, any parting short, and as you close, what's your favorite restaurant in Nairobi, and what's your favorite restaurant in London? Oh, um... So as parting shot, I mean, uh, I mean, on a very practical basis, for people who are interested in sort of uh, taking ideas forward, then please do talk to, to Billy, to Enos, uh, and to Andy, and they can talk to you about some of the, the things that we've t talked about today. Because I know that you place a big emphasis as a university in sort of practical outcomes and being uh, grounded. So we would like to do that. So please do uh, talk to them if you want to understand um, either how a sort of a country like the UK thinks about these things, but also some of the specific opportunities is that Billy uh, just talked about. Favourite restaurant in Nairobi? Yeah. I'm tempted to be diplomatic and not give an answer for fear of offending somebody. So I would say, yeah, no, I'm going to be diplomatic and take the Fifth Amendment on that. Excellent. And in, the, and in the UK, it's always your local pub. So it's the Fantastic. pub which is... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, it's my house. That you have to be loyal to and say that that's your favorite. Fantastic. And I think we'll finish on that note. A round of applause for the High Commissioner.
as I hand back to Mandela. Thank you very much. A fascinating conversation. One hour has just flown by. We hope you'll come back. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much.